fréttir. Komið öll sæl og blessuð og velkomin á fund VAFIB um ábyrgar fjárfestingar. Bæði þið sem eru hérna með okkur í salnum í Hörpu og eins þið sem eru að fylgjast með okkur á netinu. Ég heiti Elín Jónsdóttir og ég er frangótastjóri VAFIB, eignastýringarsviðis Íslandsbanka. Við spyrjum í yfirskrift fundarins hvaða skoðun hafa þínir peningar. Það hlýtur að vera aðkallandi spurning á Íslandi í dag. Mart hefur breyst í samfélaginu á síðustu árum og kannski sérstaklega í fjármálagerinum þó að sömu vil ég meina annað. En þó erum við enn eftir bátar nágræna landa okkar, hvort sem að horft er til vestus eða austus, þegar kemur að því hugmyndakerfi sem að kallast ábyrgar fjárfestingar eða social responsible investing. Dagskrafundari sé þannig að ég mun byrja á því að fara að þessi nokkrum orðum vítt og breytt yfir þetta hugmyndakerfi ábyrgar fjárfestingar. Síðan fáum við aðalræðum að dagsins David Chen sem að mun kafa dýpra ofan í sérstaklega eina tegund ábyrgra fjárfestinga, svo kallaðar áhrifa fjárfestingar. Og loks fáum við panel af góðum gestum sem að krifur máli aðeins betur. Björn Berg, fræðslustjóri VAFIB, stýri panelnum og með honum í panel verða Gunnar Baldinsson, frangöldastjóri almenna lífrissjóðsins, Helga Lín Hákunadóttir, lögmaður og meðeigandi í strategíu, David Senna sjálfsögðu og svo Birna Einarsdóttir, bankastjóri Íslandsbanka. Fundi líkur svo klukkan tíu. Nú, SRI eða ábyrgar fjárfestingar hefur þið skilgreint þannig að það eru fjárfestingar þegar hortir til fleiri þátta heldur um fjárhæslega við töku ákvörðunar. Oftast er þá verið að horfa til félagslega þátta, umhverfisþátta og góðra stjórnarhátta. Það eru þessi þrjú meginatri sem við verið að skoða. Sameinuðu þjóðnar hafa sett grundvallar sjónamið um ábyrgar fjárfestingar, UN Principles for Responsible Investing, sem að einsir sem stýra fjármönum hafa skrifað undir og undirgengist að fylgja. En SRI er líka tengt öðru hugtaki, CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility, og fjárfesta sem fjárfesta með ábyrgum hætti horfa þá gerna til þess að fyrirtæki sem fjárfestir í séu að fylgja þessu CSR kerfi, eða Corporate Social Responsibility. Og þar koma samlega þjóðna líka inn í og hafa sett staðla um það hvað er að vera með góða stjórnarhætti innan fyrirtækja og er það vel þekkt kerfið þar sem heiti Global Compact sem að mörg íslensk fyrirtæki hafa skrifað undir. Það er að það er íslensk banki. Það er aftúrlega að ásla sömu þætti og í ábyrgum fjárfestingum, það er að segja félagslega þætti, til dæmis eins og vinnuvernd og mannetindi umhverfismál og stjórnarhætti og oft er að horfa þá sérstaklega á vörn gegn spillingum. Nú, það er ímsum aðfram beitt þegar fyrsti stefnum um ábyrgar fjárfestingar og um að flokka það gróflega í svona fjórar aðferðir. Það er í fyrsta lagi kannski elsta formi á þessu að útiloka tiltekið fyrirtæki, það er nekka til screening og Þá er þekkt að fjárfesta velja að útiloka til dæmis tóbaksiðnað eða vopnaframleiðslu eða eitthvað slíkt. En svo er líka til þess með hefur kallað positive screening eða að fjárfesta bara í þeim fyrirtækjum sem eru best í sínu flokki. Og þá er gerna hvort í þess hversu vel þeir eru að standa sig í corporate social responsibility. En síðan hefur verið að færa stíðvöxt á síðustu árum að nýta atkvæðisett á hlutafundum og atkvæðisett eða afl hlutafarna til þess að hafa áhrifti góðs innan fyrirtækja. Og þá verið að beita stjórnundu fyrirtækja að þrýstingi til þess að breyta á hvernig þáttum í starfseminni. Og það hefur verið gert bæði með engasamtölum eða með meira með opinberum hætti. Það má sjá á hvað er mun á því hvernig þetta er gert í bandargjónum og í Evrópu og bandargjónum hafa verið meira í því sem er kallað aktivism eða sérhóttur aktivism og eru þessi opinberi þrýstingur komaði tillögur á hlutafundum og safnaði síðan atkvæðum. 
En þá meiri við pall upp á pallborðið í Evrópu að að beita svona þrýstingi á maður og mann eða undir fjögur augu sem hann verið kallað engagement. Svo er það það sem að hefur verið að þróast núna á hvers ekki allar síðustu árum og hérna David Sjönd hækkir mjög vel sem eru svona áhrifafjörfæstingar og sömur kalla hérna SR 2.0 næsta skref í þróun þessar fjörfæstinga og þá er beinlínis verið að fara í fjörfæstingar til þess að hafa áhrifti góðs án þess þó að gefa eftir kröfuna um háastum. En hvers vegna er áhýinn á ábyrgum fjárfestingum að aukast jafn mikið og reyndir vitni? Hvað er að breytingum í áttilaukinnar áherslu á SRI? Það var í gegnum tíðina verið meðal annars þegar það kom upp nýkslismálin á fyrirtækja. Það má sjá að þá eykst áhýinn á ábyrgum fjárfestingum. Í Evrópu má sjá að hérna aukna áhugslu á SR í eftir að eitthvað var eitthvað tímabili á seitt og síðustu öldlaug. Þá voru þau lönd sem að voru með því að vera með í ríkiseigu stórfyrtæki. Kannski almenningur þar hafði þörf fyrir að gerði kröfu til þess að það væri ákveðnar kröfur og aðhald á stórfyrtæki. Og þar hérna Þar er þá litið á SRV sem tæki til þess að hafa viðhald einhvers konar stjórn eða hafa eftirlit með stórfyrtækjum. Nú svo segja margir að skamtíma hugsun sem að einkennir hérna rekstur fyrirtækja nú til dags og stafar meðal annars af markaðnum og þessari kröfu um sífelda upplýsingagjöf og það sem er verið að refsa og umbuna bara fyrir hvernig gengur í hérna hverjum ásfjórðungi eða jafnvel hverjum mánuði eða og hverjum degi að þar koma ábyrgar fjárfestingar inn og vega svolítið upp á móti. Þannig að þess að þarna verið að horfa þá á þætti sem að má gera ráð fyrir að hafi áhrif til lengri tíma. En svo má líka sjá að það er stór áhrifavaldur í því hversu mikið fjör önnur til ábyrgra fjárfestinga þegar löggjöf er breytt. Og besta dæmi um það er sjálfsagt löggjöf um jarðsprengjur. Það sem að fjölmarga þjóðir hafa skrifað undir sáttmála sem að banna slíkt. Og það hefur þá leitt til þess að mjög mörg fjárfestingafélög skuldbinda sér til þess að fjárfesta ekki í vopna framleiðendum sem að taka þátt í slíkri framleiðslu. Og í raun og veru er núna svo komið að 40% af öllu fjö í stýringu í Evrópu má flokkast til ábyrgar fjárfestingar meðal annars út af þessu. En síðast en ekki síst þá hafa lífir í sjóði verið leiðandi afl í ábyrgu fjárfestingum síðar ára. Og þeir geta haft gríðarlega áhrif eins og dæmin sanna og þegar við horfum til Nóreks til dæmis. En þá ef við snúum okkur að stöðinu í nágrannalöndunum þá er mjög áhugavert að skoða nágrannalöndin og í raun og veru sjá og velta því fyrir sér hvers vegna erum við öðru vísi og höfum ekki tekið þessi skref sem hafa verið tekin á Norðurlöndunum. Það er svo margt líkt með Norðurlöndunum. Hvað sem við horfum á efnaðslega stöðu eða hversu þróuð þau eru eða á félagslegt gildismatt. Og og það er þá áhvert að sjá að því að kemur að eignum í stýringu sem að flokka má sem ábyrga fjárfestingar að þá eru þau alls ekki lík. Svíþjóð var langfyrst Norðurlandana til þess að fara inn á þessa braut og það munaði jafnvel bara áratugum hvað þeir voru langt að undan. En það er síðan koma Norðmenn og hafa núna farið fram úr þeim öllum Og það er alveg sama hvort að maður er að horfa á heildastærð SRI markaðarins eða fjárfestingar sem hlutfalla landsframleiðslu eða SRI fjárfestingar með eða höfðatölu að normenn eru þar alls staðar að skara fram úr. Og þarna gætur auðvitað áhrifa norska olíusjóðsins. Sjóðurinn gefur út skjöl um væntingar sína til fyrirtækja sem þeir kalla expectations documents og á sviði 
enn sem komið er, er þetta þrjú svið sem þeir gefa út slík skjöl, það er á sviði mannitindamála, batna, vassvendar og loftslagsbreytinga. Síðan nota þeir aðkvæðasjætt sinn til að hafa góð áhrif á stjórnarhætti og sjálfbætni og hafa gefið út afstöðuskjöl sem þeir kalla position papers til að ákveðina álitamála í varðandi stjórnarhætti. Þessi sjóður, það er að segja global hlutin, alþjóðlegi hluti eftirlauna sjóðsnormanna á hlut í 9.000 fyrirtækjum um allan heim og getur þess vegna haft gríðalega áhrif. Og í fyrir að seldi sjóðurinn hlut sinn í 73 fyrirtækjum beinlínis vegna þess að þeir eftir að hafa farið yfir mat sitt á umhverfis og félagslegum áhættu þáttum í rekstri töldu sér ekki stætt á því að vera hlutafar í þessum félagum einhver. Þannig að þannig eru þeir bæði að segja frá hver afstaða sín er og síðan að breyta í samrami við það. Um, á Íslandi er ekki tekið saman tölfræði um það hversu mikið af eignum í stýringu fjármálafyrirtækja lífri sjóða eða annara er í ábyrgum fjárfestingum. Og, og þetta er nú eitt af því sem að væri gaman að sjá breytingar verða á, þar sé bara við furum að fylgjast með þessu og, og, hérna, og flokka það. En það er ljóst að fjölmörg fyrirtæki Íslandska hafa skrifað undir Global Compact saminuðu þjóðana og, og fleiri alþjóðasáttmála um góða stjórnarhætti. Þá hafa nokkri íslenski ræðilega skrifað undir meginmarkmið saminuðu þjóðina um fjárfestingar og Íslandsbanki er að undirbúa slíkt í sama. Nú, Íslandsbanki hefur sett sér stefnu um ábyrgar fjárfestingar og, undirbúin, og undirbýr eins og ég segja að skrifa undir þessi meginmarkmið og síðan má nefna að dóttu fyrirtæki bankans Íslandsjóðir hafa sett sér stefnu um nýtingu atkvæðisjættar. Það er ljóst að við eigum tölvert í land með að ná sambærlegum stærðum í ábyrgum fjárfestingum og nágrannalönd okkar en við höfum allar forsendur til að ná því uh, tiltölega hratt. Og það sem að hér eru áhrifaríkir fagfjörfestar sem að geta ef vilji stendur til haft áhrif í þessa átt uh, tiltölega hratt. Og uh, now in order um, to introduce our main speaker I will switch over into English. We are fortunate to have with us today someone who has both a practical and an academic experience of socially responsible investing and who has also taken part in developing the way this is practiced. <coughs> David Chen is the CEO of Equilibrium Capital in Portland, Oregon, a global asset management firm focusing on sustainable investments. David teaches the topic of sustainability and finance at Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University and at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University. He is also, among many other board seats, the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco's Portland branch. Now, um, join me in, in welcoming David to the podium. Good morning, and uh, I would uh, I'd like to first start by uh, thanking uh, Islan Banki. My taxi driver made me practice that uh, <laughs> this morning. I'm not sure I did it justice, but uh, for hosting and uh, inviting me to, uh, to Iceland here to, to talk about uh, a topic that I'm passionate about. Uh, as, uh, as I was introduced, uh, I'm the uh, chairman and founder and uh, CEO of uh, of uh, equilibrium, and uh, I won't speak much about it this morning, uh, except the, the fact that, that uh, we are about a $1.3 billion U.S. Uh, investor in uh, real assets that all have sustainability as a key uh, driving investment thesis uh, for what we do. That's really the last that I'll speak about it. Uh, I was asked this morning really to talk less about our company and more about the field of impact and sustainable finance and a little bit about where it is as a, uh, as a global investment strategy. This is a field that has many terms. 
Uh, it's called responsible investing. Uh, this morning we already called it socially responsible investing. Uh, in the foundation world, it's oftentimes called mission-related uh, investing, uh, mission investing, oftentimes known as also ESG, environmental, social, and governance, triple bottom line, profit with a purpose, corporate social responsibility, impact investing, and now, most lately, sustainable finance. And one of the things I'd like to do this morning in the opening remarks is to peel this apart a little bit. And I'd like to actually make it a little simple. Um, when I start my class, I ask the students a very simple question. What's the difference between a collateralized debt obligation, a CDO, of subprime debt, which arguably caused the 2007 downturn, and the securitization of a microfinance portfolio? Anybody? I joke, not so funny, but I joke that both of them are dead instruments to poor people. But the difference was intentionality. At least in the US, the subprime debt market was a predatory marketplace to take advantage of people. And the uh, microfinance market is a credit instrument, identically, that was to intentionally attempt to benefit people and bring them out of poverty. But at the end of the day, both instruments are effectively the same set of financial principles. And in fact, the CDO and the securitization are almost identical instruments. Now, intentionality is something that I'd like you to remember. The second thing, and it's a quandary that I ask the students, is, well, if one is predatory and one is intentionally beneficial, why is it that institutional investors bought a trillion dollars of garbage, and this that has a 98% repayment record uh, is considered something scary. And you would never put this in your pension plan. But we bought a trillion dollars of garbage. Why? Because one was sold by Goldman? I, I don't know. But that's a second question that, that, that I'd ask you to ask yourself. Did anyone see the movie uh, The Big Short? I don't think of it as a movie. I almost think of it as a documentary. Um, I, uh, I was a terrible, terrible person during that movie to sit around because uh, I, I had the, uh, the privilege of being on the Federal Reserve Board of San Francisco at the time of, of 2006, 7, 8, 9, 10. And so as we were watching this movie, everybody around me had to put up with these noises. Oh, ah, oh. And uh, as, uh, just cringing throughout the entire movie uh, as, as, as reliving these moments. And I'm sure with the crisis here in Iceland, for those of you that saw the movie, you've probably felt the same way, that uh, it was a very personal movie in, in, in some ways. But the, 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 the most poignant scene in the movie for me, and I don't know if any of you remember it, was when uh, the two kids uh, that were buying uh, the short sale the, the hedge fund kids from Colorado, the really young guys, and, uh, and they came out of Las Vegas and they're dancing and they're saying, my gosh, we're gonna make a ton of money. Can you believe that they sold us these short positions? And Brad Pitt, the older character, says to them, stop dancing. Do you realize that for us to win this investment or this transaction or this bet, in order for us to win this bet, it means that millions of Americans have lost their home. And so the poignancy of that and the intention of that, again, I'd like you to think about that when we go further into our conversation today. A simple definition of impact investing, and I'm gonna differentiate that a little bit later from sustainable finance, is using markets and investment tools to drive positive impact on the environment and community and deliver a return to the investors. This is not about donors, this is about an investment strategy and it has an intentionality to create a positive benefit. So remember that Brad Pitt comment, remember the CDO and the microfinance. The opportunities to apply sustainable finance and impact investing are throughout, and, and they include environmental issues like climate change, global demographic shift, the consumption of the middle class, 
Uh, I jokingly say that much of sustainable investing revolves around another two billion people entering the middle class and wanting to eat meat and drive a car. And that's a global demographic issue of consumption. And what are we going to be doing then in terms of the use of materials, of water, of metals, of energy? It's about resource constraint and productivity. It's about energy. It's about water. It's about agriculture and food. And it's about environmental services. Equally important market failures on the social side, uh, affordable housing, bottom of the pyramid, financial inclusion, food and hunger, health, education, the energy gap, and clean water access. These are all examples of current market failures that we can apply markets, market making, and potentially uh, the use of capital and investment strategies to make a difference and change the course of these market failures. The one asterisk point in the bottom there is we have to remember that not all problems can be solved by markets. If I step back, and maybe just a little bit of history, I, I think that, that, that right now we're at a very important moment in this, in this genre called uh, in, uh, responsible investing. It all started, as many of you know, in the 1970s and 1980s uh, with socially responsible investing faith-based uh, uh, organizations and pensions were oftentimes the leading investors, religions, uh, religious pensions like the Methodists, the Episcopal, the, the, uh, the Lutherans were all at the front end of many of these issues. Uh, uh, Vietnam, apartheid, environmental, these were all what drive it. I, I call this the period of no. Uh, typically the strategy that was used at that time was exclusion. We won't do this, we won't do that, we won't use this in our portfolios. Uh, it was oftentimes linked with underperformance of the portfolio. But we also had significant, significant uh, innovation at that period of time. Uh, we had SRI funds and shareholder activism was started, microfinance was started. And in the U.S., that was also the period when, in the 1970s, when the first Sox and Knox tradings, which were uh, greenhouse gas tradings, were uh, first used very effectively, and it was really the birthing of the, uh, of the carbon markets. In the 2000s, in the middle, uh, we began to debate a very different issue, and that was, can we deliver positive outcomes for society and for the environment and generate returns, or is it an or? Do we have to give up one to get the other? Do we have to get, get one or give up the other? And is there, a, is there a, 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 a zero sum game there? The positive aspect of that is it created a tremendous amount of awareness and debate. We also had the, in the, in the 2000s, the European Kyoto trading started to take place, which energized the world about the use of markets to change the environment and the use of market making mechanisms in the mainstream. In 2007, we also saw the beginning of the Global uh, Impact Investors Network, more than mission, and the beginning of the benefit corporations, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. In 2008, we also saw JP Morgan issue out the first uh, investment banking Wall Street paper that argued that this was in fact a, 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 a strategy of investment that was coming into the, into the mainstream. We had Mohammed Yunus win the Nobel Prize. We had several microfinance institutions go public. And as a result, we increasingly saw the mainstreaming of many of these, of these investment strategies. At that point in time, in the mid-2000s, the, the vast majority of the conversation was around social enterprise, venture capital models that, that dominated the impact investing conversation. If we fast forward to today, we're now entering a third phase. And that is, we're asking whether, in, in fact, sustainability and responsibility and impact may, in fact, drive your returns. So returns from impact. We're transitioning now from ideals, ideas, to actually strategies and products. The conversation, if you listen carefully, and I'm going to come back to this when we talk about COP21, if you listen to the vocabulary that was used at COP21, the vocabulary is no longer the imperative, the advocate. The, the vocabulary is now about risk, and it's about the economics of a low-carbon economy. So the conversation has shifted to risk and economics. 
we now have new terms, impact investing, investing with impact, and sustainable finance. We now realize that the ability for intentional impact now applies across almost every one of the asset classes. No longer just venture and social enterprise or public equities, but across everything. Fixed income with the growth of green bonds, private equity, hedge fund strategies, it now applies across every asset class. And we're now starting to talk seriously about scale, and we're watching institutions, pensions, sovereign wealth funds entering this field in the last two years uh, as, as we've never seen before. We're watching this environmental, social, and governance issue and sustainability transitioning to the mainstream. We're watching mainstream in institutions beginning to frame this uh, uh, ESG and climate as an economic and value terms. Almost every one of the major investment houses, uh, BlackRock, Goldman, Morgan, UBS, Credit Suisse, JP Morgan, Barclays, has instituted within the last 24 months major programs in this area. The Bank of England, uh, Mark Carney issued out of ma several major policy speeches in the last 12 months articulating that climate change represents a material risk to markets. That's a link to a, a one of the speeches that he gave which really set in motion this link between these environmental issues, sustainability, impact, and the health of the markets. We're watching pensions and sovereign wealth funds. Uh, execute sustainability investment protocols and allocations. One of the, my favorites that, to, to point out uh, that started in the early 2000s is the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan. They, they were one of the first to e enter into, into these environmental and, and sustainable strategies. And their reasoning was very simple. They're a pension plan. By definition, they're long term. They have a long horizon. They believe that as fiduciaries, if they were in possession of information that had to do with the long term, that coincided with their obligations to their pensioners, that they would be in breach of fiduciary duty if they ignored it in their pension management. They looked at climate change. They didn't argue whether climate change was man-made or not. They just argued whether climate change was stochastically and probabilistically accurate, and if it was, within the time frame of their obligation to their pensioners, they felt that it was absolutely necessary for them to evaluate first the downside risk and then the opportunity set. They took a two-year exercise in the mid-2000s to evaluate fully their entire portfolio of close to $200 billion Canadian and evaluated the risk that was inherent in their portfolio and began the process of rebalancing their portfolio. We've seen this take place at CalPERS. In 2013, the investment protocol that was released specifically articulated that, and this seems to be so obvious, that CalPERS is a long-term investor. At $300 billion, it's the largest pension plan in the United States, and that it is a long-term investor. And within the long-term investment horizon, sustainability was viewed as an asset productivity and an asset resilience uh, component of their protocol. And so they didn't embed sustainability in a CSR program or a sustainability mandate. They cut across the entire portfolio and asked the question, where can we create benefit and where can we manage risk as a result of sustainability and long-term approach? PGGM in 2015 uh, announced what could be argued as their third generation, and many of you know PGGM. It's one of the largest pension plans in, in Holland. Uh, APG has the very same thing. Uh, the Northern Europeans, many of them have been practicing this for better part of 10, 15 years, uh, especially the Swedish uh, pension plans, the Dutch pension plans. But we're watching pan-Europe now, uh, especially in the UK now, catching up and begin to implement these protocols. Perhaps the most surprising uh, is, uh, has, have any of you uh, read the letter that was sent out by Larry Fink uh, the CEO of BlackRock just a few weeks ago. All right. now, this is a complete shock. So Larry Fink sent out a letter to the S&P 500 CEOs and to several of the Global 500 European CEOs. 
and, and, and I'll, just, I'll just read this to you if you don't mind. So this is an excerpt from his letter. Generating sustainable returns over time requires a sharper focus not only on governance, but also on environmental and social factors facing companies today. These issues offer both risks and opportunities, but for too long, companies have not considered them core to their business, even when the world's political leaders are increasingly focused on them, as demonstrated by the Paris Climate Accord. And then in bold, over the long term, environmental, social, and governance issues ranging from climate change to diversity of board effectiveness have real and quantifiable financial impact. At companies where ESG issues are handled well, they are often a signal of operational excellence. BlackRock has been undertaking a multi-year effort to integrate ESG considerations into our investment process, and we expect companies to have strategies to manage these issues. In other words, the largest investor in the world, $5 trillion, uh, has made ESG a issue uh, uh, at the highest level of the corporation and has sent out a signal that environmental, social, and governance issues are going to be used as a core part of the evaluation of the asset, and in this case, public companies. I mean, that's it's un almost unimaginable 24 months ago that, that this would be the case. Equally, we've seen changes taking place in public policy and governance and, and regulations across the world. Uh, all the way from the G8 uh, impact investing initiative that was announced by Prime Minister Cameron and, uh, and had a global working body to create a set of, of recommendations for each of the G8 and then ultimately expanded to the G20. In 2015, the U.S. Department of Labor ERISA, which is the law that governs most American pension plans, uh, issued a very, very careful worded clarification. And again, I, I, I'm just going to just indulge me in letting me read this. It's too carefully crafted by the government. The new guidance confirms that the department's longstanding view that fiduciaries may not accept lower expected returns or take on greater risks in order to secure collateral benefits, but may take on such benefits into account as tiebreakers when investments are otherwise equal with respect to their economic and financial characteristics. That first sentence basically says you're a fiduciary and you're not off the hook. You're still responsible for generating high rates of return for the fiduciaries and for the beneficiaries of your pension plan. Very important sentence. It says that nothing has changed. The second sentence, however, is where the change takes place. The guidance also acknowledges that environmental, social, and governance factors may have a direct relationship to the economic and financial value of an investment. When they do, these factors are more than just tiebreakers, but rather are proper components of the fiduciary's analysis of the economic and financial merits of competing investment choices. So what the Canadians decided was fiduciary duty in the mid-2000s. Uh, ten years later, the Americans uh, at the Department of Labor that defined the pension laws uh, came to agreement. But these are, these are two massive, massive sea changes that have taken place in the last 24 months, 12 months. In, in November, uh, President Obama issued out uh, 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 an executive order that every one of the agencies in the United States, the Department of Labor, the Department of Agriculture, Department of Defense, were to use environmental markets and market-making mechanisms to uh, achieve uh, our environmental and climate change objectives. Uh, again, enforcing the fact that, that, that markets should be used as a mechanism for affecting change. We're watching President Xi in China executing public policy around climate and carbon, primarily around uh, making sure that the quality of life in China maintains. And we're watching the, 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 the changes that are taking place there as well in water in energy and in carbon. We're watching benefit corporation laws being executed globally. Uh, Italy just executed the, 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 the benefit laws. Uh, several of the South American countries have executed uh, benefit corporation laws. And in the US, the 
the seat of American corporate law, which is the state of Delaware, uh, in 2014 uh, passed the benefit corporation law, which gave which gives the fiduciaries, the board of directors and corporate fiduciaries, the right to balance the environment, their employees, society with shareholders and not consider shareholders supreme. And then of course there was COP21. We're also watching very rapidly research on markets uh, and market returns and sustainability. Almost every one of the major research business schools, Wharton, uh, uh, Harvard, uh, are issuing out now, uh, I think, tremendous amounts of research. The Bob Eccles uh, paper that was uh, 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 published in September, October of, of 2013 is also a remarkable paper that, 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 that traces the effect on shareholder wealth as well as market share and competitiveness of companies that were high ESG uh, over a 20-year period of time. We have databases on ESG research that have been compiled by CalPERS and Deutsche Bank. Uh, Mercer and, and uh, Cambridge Associates released two papers uh, in the last 12 months, uh, both of those which have links there, which trace the downside risk uh, in your pension portfolios of, of, of these uh, demographic shifts and climate change. New York Common, the pension plan, uh, used the Mercer report, uh, the Mercer toolkit, and estimated that upwards of 30 or 40 percent of their portfolio was at risk uh, in, uh, in a climate change scenario. And that has caused that, that, that pension to dramatically put in place a set of, of protocol changes to, uh, to, to manage that risk. We have cost accounting tools that are coming out of places like PricewaterhouseCoopers, which are now starting to value and put metrics on externalities, the cost of pollution, the cost of energy, the cost of water, uh, the cost of, 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 of negative effects on the community. And lastly, we're starting to see the next generation of products, investment products and investment strategies beginning to emerge from almost every one of the major institutional uh, uh, financial and, uh, services companies. COP21, I think, was a major turning point, and I'm a, I'm a, in some ways, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bit of a, of a, of a wonk in, in my interest in, in studying vocabulary, the words that people use. And I think that if you really think about and listen to what happened at COP21, the words changed, uh, and, and uh, the presence there was no longer the CSR or the Office of Sustainability. It was now the CEO and the Chief Investment Officer that was attending. And this is much beyond, break, uh, much beyond signatory. The language now shifted to risk, resiliency, and asset value from advocacy and imperative. It spoke about externalities, the exposure, the constraint, the cost, the optimization, and taking advantage. It was really about the realization that we were moving to a low carbon economy, and there were going to be losers, and there were going to be winners. And then it was the recognition that, the, that you didn't want to be left behind when the legacy assets or the legacy business models began to decline. All you have to look at in the U.S. is the bankruptcies that are taking place in the coal industry in the last 12 months. 24 months, we've now had five bankruptcies of the major uh, coal companies, and it's not over yet. So as an investor, these are no longer theoretical issues. These are now very real issues about your portfolio. And in some ways, the announcement of the Chevy Bolt is more important than the, than the marketing of the, of the Tesla. It really is part of the signaling of the next generation of the competitiveness of the low carbon economy. So the tenor and the speeches and the words have shifted, the strategies have shifted. One of the things that, 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 that I'd like to leave you with is a, is a thought about how this market is in some ways underneath the surface subtly changing. I think there are three very separate conversations that are starting to take place. They're using very different words and in some ways they mean very different things. Impact investing, it's typically the word and the concept that foundations and high net worth and private banks are using. And in general that that set of investment ideas 
revolves around this, this, this thinking that your capital can do more than generate returns. It can also reflect your values. The, the, the main point within impact investing is the idea that your money can do more. Contrast that very differently than the word sustainable investing, and that's a word that you see starting to take place inside of the institutions, the pensions, the sovereign wealth funds, and the endowments. And there, the language is not your capital can do more. The language there is about risk and the value in sustainability. It's the language of risk and portfolio management. And then the third area that, that's in this space is the broad area of ESG and responsibility. And that's primarily the, 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 the vocabulary that's being used by corporations around corporate social responsibility evolving into strategies, products, and risks, and opportunities, and increasingly for companies, the right to operate. And so as we talk about this concept, it's really important to understand what audience are you talking about and what audience are you talking to, but we're seeing the segmentation of three very different conversations that are taking place. All of them, however, are now moving into the mainstream. With that, I think that uh, I'm going to end and, uh, and just uh, leave you with one thought. I left you with a couple of thoughts at the beginning. Um, this is a very complex issue. And as I was uh, landing at, uh, at, the, at your airport, there's a, there's a massive billboard as you walk in that says that uh, Iceland is 100% renewable energy. And so in some ways, Iceland has been on the forefront, maybe not intentionally as part of the sustainable and impact investing area, but you've been on the forefront of, of this issue just by the virtue of, of your source of energy and by virtue of what that source of energy has allowed you to do. You can make the argument that many parts of your low carbon economy and green economy came from a decision or the benefit that you've had of, of, of renewable energy. But it's also complex. In a conversation I had yesterday, uh, it was mentioned that, 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 that your renewable energy is sometimes a conflict with uh, sustaining or, or preserving your natural beauty and your natural habitat. Do you build dams for the hydro? Do you spoil the nature? I only mention that because as we move into this area of sustainable finance, of impact investing, it's important to re remember that, that, that these are some of the most complex economic and natural systems. And we're going to make mistakes, and they're not easy, and they're full of quandaries and give and take. And so we've got a lot to learn, even though I'm incredibly optimistic that we have now moved us this field into the mainstream. We're just now beginning to understand the subtleties and the complexities in this field. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave, for a, a fascinating presentation. Uh, I think you ended exactly at the uh, right question, whether, uh, whether it's as easy as, as deciding to be uh, sustainable and uh, positive, but it can come at a cost. But uh, what I would like to by, uh, begin by addressing is um, the largest investors that we have in Iceland, which are the pension funds. Um, Elin uh, told us a little bit about how things are currently standing in uh, Scandinavia. Uh, they have moved forward. Uh, Sweden has been doing sustainable investing for a very long time. Uh, Norway, uh, forced in part by the oil fund, has uh, gained ground quite quickly. And we will discuss a little bit uh, later on uh, a very interesting part of the discussion about Norway, which is the impact that the Norwegian oil fund has had on asset managers and uh, fund companies in Norway. But regarding our pension funds, um, if I begin with you, Helga, and the, the question of how this discussion has been moving uh, forward in Iceland, are we 
are we just beginning these discussions uh, or has, has it been going on within the uh, pension system? And it would be very interesting in, in, uh, hearing Gunnar's uh, response afterwards also. Mm -hmm. But Helga, how has this discussion been? First of all, I'd like to thank David for a very interesting uh, lecture this morning. Um, I think actually that uh, a lot of things have and are happening in the Icelandic pension fund system as uh, with the rest of Europe where we are I'm sorry to say, still recovering from the recession, it actually had a really big impact. And uh, maybe our main focus has been on recovering and, and redefining Iceland and uh, our roles within it. Um, I think Icelandic pension funds are redefining their approach on investments. I think uh, the general discussion in Europe about uh, the engagement, the shareholder policies, and uh, how the engagement bet between the pension funds and the boards and the companies should go about is actually in a nice uh, path in Iceland. They are actually uh, uh, realizing that if it's, it's not possible to be a, a passive, 100% passive investor. But then again, it's really important to define how you engage, how you make the impact, on what level, what items, and, and so on. So what I, I, I've been advising pension funds and institutional investors on shareholder policies. Uh, and, and the main thing is that we're not making cold calls to the companies and say you should do this or that. But we should define a strategy how each pension fund or each institutional investor should impact. And on the other hand, then, we have actual impact investors who are not pension funds, but invest to have impact, to, to take a seat on board and have uh, certain strategies. So there's a, a different level on how you make the impact. But in Iceland, we are really uh, studying how to be sophisticated about the impact on, on, on which levels. And this is so relevant in Iceland these days. It's, it's, it should not be short term. It should never be short term uh, popular, uh, populism or anything like that. And what I, wh where you had me, David, when I started reading your homepage and, and your interviews is, it's the long-term sustainability. That's a key word. And that has to be built into the DNA of all pension funds, all investors, all boards, every company, and uh, everyone who actually is engaging in, in our economy as a whole. So, or the so uh, even the, our, 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 our social system. So. Are we still in the definition phase? Gunnar, are we just beginning to discuss these things? Uh, so uh, any planned and organized uh, sustainable or, or, or uh, responsible investments on behalf of the pension funds, they have not started yet, have they? Well, I would say that uh, we haven't started. Uh, we've been discussing uh, this issue for, for many years. Uh, some of us have maybe not defined a formal strategy yet, but uh, at least three pension funds are, uh, have signed the UN principles of responsible investing. And these three pension funds, they count for 41% of the pension fund industry. So that's a size that matters. So uh, I would say there has been discussions. Uh, it's continuing. And uh, well, I came here this morning to, to learn and to listen. And uh, I realized that. I have a lot to learn. Exactly. Uh, David, uh, maybe a little bit of a short response to this. Um, in this stage, what would you in, uh, advise? So I put you on the spot as an advisor to the Icelandic pension system. Uh, if, the, if the pension funds are now just beginning this discussion and, and trying to come up with a good definition, should they follow what has been done well in other countries? Or does this has to be, have to be tailored to each country? I, I certainly think that there are commonalities that, that, that cut across all the pensions, but I think that there are unique uh, regulatory or unique protocols that are different. But you have a benefit here in the Northern European, uh, well, you're very far away from that, but, but th there's just such a wonderful set of, of peer groups uh, between the Dutch pensions and the, uh, the Nordic countries' pensions that have all wrestled with this issue. And, and, and it's not that you need to replicate what they've done, but they're a wonderful opportunity to exchange ideas, to exchange protocols. Many of these are public plans, and so they're public documents. And many of these 
uh, entities are more than happy to sit down and, and have a conversation. In fact, in some ways, the PGGM folks, as an example, see it as part of their mission to uh, uh, have these conversations with their peer groups. So, so I think that we're in a period right now where uh, no one's that far ahead, except maybe some of the Europeans, and almost everyone is interested in having this conversation. Probably the most interesting is we're now starting to see even, even the pensions that had the least amount of interest in sustainability, uh, some of the Asian pensions uh, that were not very much interested in this or the sovereign wealth funds. It's interesting what starts to happen. Uh, in Singapore now, there's, um, between Tomasic and GIC, there's now um, this conversation about the haze. And the haze is what happens every year in uh, Southeast Asia when Indonesia begins to burn the rainforest. And we all know the, the incredible deleterious impact of, of burning the rainforest. And so this is now, it's now in my backyard, and it's now a personal issue. And now there's the conversation about how can investment capital and market-making mechanisms be used in instigated perhaps by Singapore and the ASEAN nations to actually relieve the haze. And so, so we're seeing these kinds of awarenesses uh, starting to accelerate and, 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 and the desire to reach out to, to the peer groups. The long-term view is necessary, isn't it, in, um, in these types of investment? And, and what I found fascinating uh, as you said, was this difference between looking at uh, responsible investments as a tick in a box. Okay, we are responsible, we are doing a good thing, uh, prevents peer disasters later on or whatever, so we're ticking in the box and we're being responsible. But you were saying that in the long term, it makes economical sense. So if you're a long-term inv uh, investor, you want to be on this side. You don't want to be on the side that inevitably has to lose because of they're un unsustainable. Uh, is that a correct... Uh, summary of, of, of the long-term view? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but no, to, 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 to just, just bring that out a little bit, I think one of the most important things that happened uh, in the CIO's office during the uh, great downturn is that the word risk and the word duration came back into the vocabulary. There was this mythical belief, none of us believed it to be true, but we all said, oh, well, the rate of return is somewhere between 10 and 12 and, uh, for, the, for the 2000s. And, uh, and, uh, and with the great downturn, we began to revisit the word risk, risk budgets, and duration. And, and it, it's, almost, it's almost ironic that CalPERS had to go through this process to re-engage with the fact that long-term was what they were obligated to do. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's the most obvious thing, but it, it, it had been somewhat lost. And when you start to look at their portfolio in the, in the context of long term, uh, it makes you make very, very different decisions. And the word sustainability no longer is nice to have. It now is about your asset, your asset resiliency, your asset productivity. I joke that if you have a two or three year horizon and you own a forest, the only rational decision economically is to clear cut it. Mm -hmm. If I'm telling you that you are going to own that forest for 100 years or more, then you take care of that forest, you make sustainable practices, you harvest at a three to 4% growth rate, you make sure that it continues to bear rent for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And so that very simple change of, is your horizon two to three years? or is it 50 to 100 years for certain classes of assets, mm -hmm. fundamentally changes your, your, your decisions. If I can, if I can elaborate a little, little bit on that and, and reflect what's happening actually in Europe. If some of you have been following the discussion there, how the legislators in different countries approach this uh, long-term thought. How can you ensure this thought about the rainforest uh, when running the company so we don't have uh, banks or, or institutions, uh, institutions uh, running out of, of their funds uh, because of short-term short thinking is that they are actually adding uh, rights to long-term shareholders. So only long-term shareholders can vote individuals on the board. So you have to own your shares for two, five, seven years only to be able to vote uh, on the board. 
And, and also with regards to the tick in the box, this is, I mean, I've, I've written articles about this. This is not a copy-paste exercise, not between companies, not between countries or, or anything. And what, what's so beautiful about Iceland is that uh, after the crisis, we're kind of reinventing ourselves. We are re reinventing what kind of a community want, do we want to create or, or uh, ecosystems or economy or, or companies or banks or insurance companies, whatever you have. We're even defining our uh, constitution. So I, I think we're in this phase, and this is a really good opportunity. Um, and, and one of the points that I try to make when I'm, I'm advising or speaking about this is, is just if you sit on a board or if you're an investor, um, who are the stakeholders? Have you actually defined the stakeholders of you as an investor? What is the strategy? What, what is the role of the board and, and the investment team? And if you sit on a board of, of a bank or an insurance company, who are the stakeholders of this company? Who are the, you know, uh, the individuals, the, uh, is it the, uh, is it the, the shareholders, is it the customers, is it even the environment, uh, and, and so on? Define the stakeholders. It makes life not really easy, but a little bit easier when you actually face uh, uh, difficult times. And also, when you, when you define them and you make it public who they are, you get the engagement from the stakeholders, the shareholders and everyone, and they say, we kind of agree to this. Or even better, when you try to make a good decision, we're not sure about this. Can we, can we discuss? So, you know, just it's about definition. It's about creating roles and, and make um, an agreement with all the stakeholders that this is your role, these are the stakeholders, and this is the direction where you should be going. Mm -hmm. You're looking at it very much from the shareholder point of view, and, and uh, which, is, which is, of course, uh, necessary. But what I, my interest in this is very much how you integrate this culture into the, your comp uh, company culture. And uh, because I think many companies, and internationally I have, uh, you know, seen it happen, you know, that companies are only doing this mainly uh, to avoid a reputational risk. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if they don't have a deeper meaning than only that, that they are really trying to drive uh, through the company a positive, uh, uh, to be a positive force in the society, to really uh, do it that way, then I think the, it is pointless. So uh, I think it needs to come from inside the company. I think it needs to come from the staff members of the company, how they would like to be that positive force. So it is not the, only the CEO uh, talking about this in the annual meeting and only to avoid reputational risk. And uh, maybe what I would like to, to mention to or, or ask you, David, is uh, because you're saying it has been a big change in the last 24 months, you know, uh, th uh, positive things have been happening. Do you think it is uh, real, real change, or is it because companies have been faced with reputational issues that they are forced to do it. You know, do you think they're doing it because they would like to be a positive force or because they, they have been faced with uh, problems? I, I don't think that there's any one answer to this. Mm. And, and, and um, I'm old enough to, rem to, to, to remember, um, I'll use an analogy. I, I, I remember in the 1980s in the US, um, quality, quality manufacturing was a key uh, competitive issue. America was absolutely being beaten by the Japanese because they were building high quality products. Mm -hmm. And America, uh, uh, American companies, and, and it, it was crazy in the 1980s, uh, they actually said things like, we can't possibly build quality into products because it would cost more. We can't possibly build products that last because it will cost more. And, and, and every one of these companies uh, eventually hired a vice president of quality. And about three or four or five years later, the most advanced companies got rid of those jobs because you couldn't be a general manager or a division president or a CEO if, in fact, you hadn't built quality throughout the process and re-engineered your corporation. And so 10 or 15 years later, the companies that said we can't possibly put quality into our products, no longer existed. They went out of business. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that in many ways this responsibility, ESG, sustainable practices is following the same thing. 
if you look at it, some companies are doing it purely for reputational. Mm -hmm. Others are deeply starting to embed this in the way that they do mm -hmm. business. And, and I think in some ways, we're going to watch the segmentation of companies over the course of the next few years. And frankly, it's not for us to tell the company what to do, but we are consumers and we're shareholders, and it's up to us to make the choices of where we want to do business. And that's exactly, I think, what's starting to take place. Mm -hmm. So I do think that many companies, there are a small set of companies that are out ahead. You know, certainly in Europe there are a number. Uh, certainly, for example, Unilever uh, is, is actively talking about whether their company should become a benefit corporation. Uh, uh, and so, so you've, got, you've got across multiple, multiple companies, I think, various grades of this conversation taking place. Um, a discussion uh, you sometimes see regarding, um, well, especially probably short-term investments, but, but long-term uh, sometimes as well, is should it be the the role of people handling other people's money to look at anything else than just risk-adjusted returns. And you have made a very good case, both you, Helga and David, that, that there is actually a case that being uh, responsible in this way is looking at risk-adjusted uh, returns for a long time. But where should this, um, if we as a country would decide that we would like to put emphasis on responsible investments and, in, 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 uh, well, the discussion we have been focusing on here today, should it come from like the association of uh, pension funds in Iceland, uh, where you, you were still on the uh, vice board, Gunnar, and were uh, chairman until uh, last year? Or should it maybe be encouraged by some kind of regulations? So I'm saying, should it be the government that with some encouragements and regulations uh, encourages the pension funds to invest their money in a certain way? Or should the pension funds themselves decide, okay, now we are going to be in this frame of mind without the, the investments? I think that uh, each individual pension fund or each individual investor has to take its own decision. Uh, I believe the Pension Fund Association can assist the pension funds by educating them and encouraging discussions. Uh, I have to say that, uh, at least for my pension fund, even though we have not defined a formal policy, we have always had a long-term horizon. We always, when it comes to investments, we've always been selective. And uh, when it comes to select uh, external managers, uh, we've always uh, been selective there too. And uh, so uh, I believe that uh, we've always focused on the long term. And, uh, but we haven't defined, at least my fund, uh, a formal policy about uh, responsible investments. And I can admit here and now that uh, maybe I am a little bit responsible for that because uh, uh, I don't want my fund to uh, say that uh, we are responsible investors if I'm, not sure that, if I'm not sure that we can monitor each and every investment whether it's responsible or not. Yeah. I also would like to say that uh, I don't know Sometimes I don't know where to draw the line. When is an investment responsible or not? There are many different opinions about that. Mm -hmm. But I think it's good that we are discussing these things. I said I came here to learn. And uh, I believe, I honestly believe that uh, pension fund and other investors, they can have a positive impact through their investments. But I don't, I don't want us to say we are following such and such strategy if there is nothing behind it. There has to be something behind it. I, you mentioned the, the government, you know, should, should it be uh, they forcing this more? And uh, I would possibly have said no, but when I was looking at the numbers that, that Elin was showing us earlier, that 40% of the, the investments in, in, in Europe are uh, in, the, in this category of investments, and it is mainly because of, of government forcing them to, to, to look at it that way. So, you know, we wouldn't have it if, if the government wouldn't, uh, if the uh, leg uh, legislation wouldn't uh, have told them. But of course, we have also seen, for example, in Iceland, the, the the corporate governance and uh, how Chamber of Commerce have been implementing that and keeping that alive. And I think most companies are um, using those guidelines in, in their uh, practice. So, so we, we have also, also uh, there we see uh, uh, no 
government body uh, uh, having a positive impact. I have to agree, and, and just to uh, comment on, on your earlier comment, I, I totally agree that the DNA of the company has to, has to uh, pair with the uh, social responsibility policy that, that the, the company stands for. My opinion is that I, I'm an optimistic. I, I think actually good things are happening in Iceland. I've been studying and researching this for maybe two and a half years and advising on it, and I'm, I'm kind of amazed how far we've come. I've, I'm amazed how how willing people are actually to learn to, to come and listen and, and, and study. So I, I think that uh, there's no need to panic at this moment or enforce a law. We, we see the guidelines from the Chamber of Commerce and a lot of companies are actually stepping into the spotlight and, and doing their own thing and making this uh, an important part of, of their, their business model. So uh, I think the rest of them will have to follow. Uh, uh, what I'm, I'm trying to say, I think everyone is actually on board uh, and, and this will happen gradually in, in the next couple of years, maybe. Uh, t talking about the company culture and, and, and how you can integrate uh, this, this discussion, uh, I, for example, I have noticed inside the bank that it is people are, uh, staff members are very, very interested in the subject. And they are the, the best... Uh, they are the best to monitor what the management is doing. You know, if they, if they have the belief and they will keep control on what is happening inside the company. And I think that is the best, best way of doing it. Yeah. Now, um, I want to uh, open the floor also for questions. If there are questions here in the hall, there is um, a staff member of Harpa here in the back with a, a microphone. Yes, we have a question back there. Thank you, and I'd like to ask you to have the uh, question short and uh, yeah. short. Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Ketil Magnusson. I come from uh, um, the Center for CSR in Iceland. Thanks for uh, the meeting and your talks. I want to actually, um, you know, the status of CSR in Iceland and the, how um, the companies and investors and, and the public is uh, approaching this issue. It's, this is moving very fast, we can see in Iceland. The, the opinions and the interest of, of, of the general public is, is rising. We see more and more companies implementing CSR, CSR strategies into their operations. But we, what we don't see in Iceland is the investment part of it uh, as much. We, we are not seeing other pension funds or the big investment uh, uh, individuals actually putting any pressure on companies on how uh, that they will invest in, in companies that are, are, are actually responsible in that sense. And I want to ask, uh, uh, will this change in, 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 in the future? Because we know that there are few pension funds that are you know, actually uh, you know, coming up with strategies, but what are they really doing? What are they, can they show us that they are actually starting to invest in uh, assets and, and projects that are actually sustainable. Yeah, thank you. So the, so the question is, um, we, we might have covered this already, uh, that this type of investment uh, is not being made, as, as uh, Kate had said, or not organized in an organized way. Uh, maybe the question is, when can we ex expect that something uh, systematic will start? Is that something you can possibly answer? <laughs> putting you on the spot. Uh, I think <laughs> Can you give us a date, I think, I think when, we are <laughs> when the Icelandic pension funds are investing uh, here in Iceland, uh, they are in, uh, investing directly in, in the firms. And uh, I think uh, most of the Icelandic pension funds, they already have a ownership policy where it is written that they want uh, companies to behave uh, responsibly or socially responsibly and to follow uh, good corporate governance. So uh, in that sense, I believe that most of the local or domestic uh, investments are, are, are responsible. Uh, when we look at the foreign assets, uh, things are more complicated. But as I said, uh, at least three funds are already members of the UN uh, PRI. Uh, but I also believe that if you look at the assets of other pension funds, that uh, most of them uh, have already invested in funds that follow these uh, guidelines or ESG guidelines. For instance, my fund, we, we are a customer of BlackRock that was mentioned here, here, here earlier. So 
I didn't quite get, get the question, but I believe that uh, the majority of our investment uh, is in, uh, is responsible, yeah. if, 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 if I can put it that way. Um, I want to share you with you a little bit, uh, which I mentioned about the Norwegians. And uh, Elin mentioned to begin with the effect that the Norwegian oil fund has had on the numbers that you saw in this slide, that uh, despite being much later uh, onto the scene than the Swedes, the Norwegians are much more uh, ob well, obviously engaged in these type of investments. And the main player was the, by far the biggest investor there, which is a Norwegian oil fund. Uh, one of our partners, um, uh, VIP, Wafibia, the asset management, has uh, or provides its clients access to funds uh, through BlackRock, through Vanguard, but also through DNB, which is uh, the largest bank in Norway. Now, DNB wanted to be a client of the Norwegian oil fund, obviously. The uh, amounts being invested there are huge, but the Norwegian oil fund has its standards regarding um, responsible investments. So what that obviously did was it encouraged DNB to filter and screen their investments in the same way. This started with a fund or some, um, some vehicles that they had for investment to begin with, but it resulted in DNB today, the largest uh, bank in Norway, screening every single fund that they have on offer. So a client of VIP, for example, who wants to invest in the funds of DMB, knows that the funds are being screened. Now, the interesting thing when you look at the way this is done in DMB is, uh, beside the way that obviously this, this uh, costs money and it isn't, uh, you know, you can't, there's, there isn't an app for that, as we sometimes say, just to, to screen everything and make sure that you are actually, exactly like Gunnar said, not just saying that you are screening and responsible that you really are. But what they do is they have a fairly narrow scope of screening. screening. They do not screen for everything. They do not include in the definition of responsible everything that we would perhaps do if we are discussing responsibility. So what they s exclude is uh, thermal coal, so uh, energy, um, and then weapons, cluster bombs, uh, weapons of mass destruction, anti-personal landmines, tobacco and pornography. This is pretty much it that's being excluded with the investments by the Norwegian oil fund through DNB and the funds of DNB. Now what they also do, and this is a very interesting part of it, is that they also have a list of things that they want companies that they are investing in to fix. So by doing that, they are actually impacting the companies, the very companies that they are investing in. And they, then there they are focusing on climate, human rights, labor rights, uh, pollution, corruption, child labor, and overall effect on the, on the environment. So they perhaps are investing in those companies, but if they are on the wrong side of these things, they try to affect the companies in the way that they will change their policies or divest if they don't. Such as uh, Elin exactly said, that they have been selling some assets in companies that do not comply. So we are seeing a real effect that a huge investor like the Norwegian oil fund is having. So in your experience, David, with this turning into the mainstream, with uh, CEOs and, uh, and investment officers now engaged, instead of just the one, uh, you know, the, the social responsibility person of the, of, of the company, um, do you think that this type of investment can have real and actual uh, change within the companies, that view we are not going to get investors unless we behave in this way? We're, we're not a public equities investor. We, uh, we invest in asset categories that are known as real assets. So real estate, uh, agriculture, energy facilities, things like that. And, and, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, more and more of our pension clients that invest in our uh, real estate portfolios, we started our real estate portfolio really in the United States as the state of the art in, in the U.S., the standard is called LEED, L-E-E-D, uh, and those are very highly energy efficient, material reuse, uh, water efficient, resource efficient, and community equality oriented set of standards. So we made our, our reputation based on, on advancing uh, green, sustainable community uh, real estate. Uh, when we started uh, in 2008 and nine which was not a great time to be starting a real estate fund. Um, uh, uh, I would say maybe 10% of the, of the pension clients, institutional clients, 
uh, really understood or cared about what we were talking about. And, and maybe 10%, but that was enough to get us going. Today, there is not a real estate uh, team that we talk to that at the very least doesn't think about this as just uh, smart investing or uh, future-proofing their, their, build, their building assets. So in, in a short period of about seven years, the idea of green sustainable real estate has gone from I don't get it, I don't care, to well, at the very least, it's just about preservation of my asset value going into the future. Then a, a, an increasing majority are looking at it as a superior investment. The flip side is also taking place. It's not unusual at all anymore for our clients, typically pensions, to be asking for us to fill out the Gresby scores. And the Gresby score is a standard for uh, sustainable renewable uh, management of real estate. And this is the largest pensions. And when your client asks you to do it, you generally do it. And we're watching even real estate firms and real estate fund managers that never had a sustainability uh, strategy or DNA because they're being asked to score and to be rated and become visible. In, in fact, I, I'll give you, I won't divulge the name, but one of the largest real estate uh, asset owners, uh, managers in the world, several tens of billions of dollars, uh, they had their Gresby score drop from upper quartile to below average. The call came from the CEO and the chairman of the board of this public held firm to the real estate team. We need to go fix this because it's now become that visible. So we're seeing this happening in, in, in asset class after asset class where the clients are starting to ask for it. And even if you're not a sustainable manager, you're now being held accountable for, for these standards. Uh, yeah. No, go ahead. I, I just one comment. I think uh, what you described earlier is, is it's one of the key words here is also transparency. And um, I think the pension funds, obviously, when they're now going to have the, um, the currency restrictions lifted and, and invest uh, more abroad because we do not have weapon industry or porn industry or so on to invest in in Iceland. But obviously there are, are, are um, you know, the, the, um, the opportunities out there are obviously uh, great for you guys. So you, I think it's a really good point to make that the, um, it's easy to define, especially if you keep it simple and obvious. And then it's also easy to keep that transparent again. So simplify and, and transparency, and also transparency applies to, to the companies. And, and uh, where I think we stand now is just, it, we're just trying to uh, digest so uh, big steps in, in general corporate governance, in, in how the boards and the companies work and how decisions are made, and uh, what we, like the proxy statements in Iceland, the stjórnar hátta yfirlýsingar, where the boards actually reflect on how they govern, in the past year and, 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 and how that affects the shareholders and so on. I mean, those are, they have a, a, a long way to go, but those are really important tools, uh, tools to reflect on uh, social responsibility, how that is applied and how that will evolve. But again, transparency and simplicity, yet uh, informative. So I think that's really important going forward. Yeah. Now we have a question here in the front. So here he comes with the microphone. Rani. Thank you. Uh, my name is Odin Potl Odnason. I'm, I'm a politician, leader of the Social Democrats in opposition here. Um, thank you very much for this uh, good debate. Uh, I have just one point. I think we always risk uh, neglecting to look at the bigger picture, which is how business is a social actor. I mean, we are talking now about institutional investors primarily and their role. But uh, what I think we fail to see is that there is a certain interaction at play. We saw it recently here in Iceland with when, um, when a publicly listed uh, insurance company decided to pay out dividends at the same time they were borrowing money and raising premiums because of bad prospects. And there was a public outcry and they were at least partially forced to withdraw that plan. And I think basically uh, when we're thinking about whether uh, pension f funds should develop uh, responsible investment strategies. I think it's not so much, you know, whether we do it, the cost will come around one day or, or, or another. I mean, if the pension funds do not develop strategies like this, 
the costs will be borne uh, by future generations one way or the other. If business doesn't uh, change the way it behaves and stops uh, behaving in a manner that causes public outcry, then it will force politicians from any party to enact new, uh, new regulations. So in part, I think my, message, my um, argument is simply this. I mean, to which extent is it simply good business, both in the short and long term, to take uh, responsible action, to tell the public that you want to be a responsible social actor, both in the short and in the long term, because otherwise you will be burdened, burdened with endless new regulations, new requirements, new taxes. And I think, I mean, this is a reality that business has to wake up, uh, up to. It's not an option to sit back, do nothing, and think that the cost will not be borne at some stage. It will be borne at some stage. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Maybe uh, Birna would be good at answering the, uh, the positive effects or the facts that it has had that the bank is focusing on these things, because uh, yeah. Business Banking for sure is focusing, focusing on being a positive driver in yeah, the uh, and community. Uh, uh, one thing also that is, is actually good to see, that research are showing that the investors or investment funds that have implemented a good strategy in, the, the, in this field, they are equally, uh, the, the return is, is uh, they, they, uh, they are not offering lower return. And it is very similar to the gender issues that uh, many research have been uh, done on. Uh, I, think, I, I think you're right. I, th I think it is uh, really needs to come from, from inside of the companies. And you were talking about the insurance company. I think the pressure of the change that was done was very much coming from inside the companies, from the staff members, you know, that were faced with the problems. So that is why I'm saying that I think the force will be coming from there, uh, that the, 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 the uh, people that are working for the companies, they would like uh, to work for a company that, uh, that is ethical and they, they are implementing social responsibility methods. So uh, I, it's good that you're saying that if it doesn't happen automatically, the, the, uh, we, we need uh, to do something from a regulatory point of view. And uh, because I was mentioning the gender issue before, you know, we were trying to, to do it without the laws for, for, for years, and it happened too slowly. So, so of course that is something to consider. And just to add, add to that, um, there is actually a, a draft directive from the EU, which is, has been in discussion for a couple of years, uh, on, on minor minority shareholders uh, protection. And that actually uh, is formulating the uh, duty of institutional investors, that is pension funds, insurance companies, and security funds, to issue their engagement strategies. And it is actually saying that you have to engage on certain things and make your engagement transparent. So the force is actually there and it's, uh, the pressure is there to have, um, I think the spotlight is maybe a little bit too much on the institutional investors, but in general, shareholders, they need to accept some of the responsibility and the burden. And that's not only changing in Iceland, it's changing globally that uh, AGMs or annual general meetings, they should not be uh, where you sit and have coffee and listen to the CEO making a statement and everyone is applauding and, and, and then you go and have a drink. It should be an interactive session um, where uh, things are put to vote, things are put for discussion, um, and uh, the en engagement, uh, how many times have I said this word here today, the dialogue, the engagement is, is so important. So we have some of the regulations coming from uh, the EU. I think it uh, will be implementing, implementing sometime next year. At the same time, and on a, on a related topic, on the business side of, of the social responsibility is that it is also uh, putting more pressure on, on uh, 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 share options and bonus schemes for employees, that those need to be more transparent and uh, more detailedly uh, approved by shareholders as well as any uh, business done with uh, related parties up to, uh, over certain volumes. So if, if you're trading with any of the, the largest shareholders, board members, and, or so on, 
uh, those big trades actually need to either be approved by the shareholders or even informed. So again, this is about how you have the shareholders uh, take some of the responsibility and, and giving the institutional investor the pressure to put in place a strategy with that regard. But Thank you. Just to, to end with uh, David, uh, maybe a short message to Icelanders who, as you hear, we, uh, this is being discussed, but uh, in the, uh, we're just beginning. It would be interesting to, uh, to pick up where we left off maybe next year or the, the year after and see where we stand then. But uh, until then, let's say in the next 12 or 24 months, what would you advise us uh, to do? You know, I, I think it sounds like you're, you're making progress here. And, and, and I would just say that, look, to answer your question that, that you sort of prompted about government, I actually think that, that these changes are not being uh, driven by government. I think they're being driven internally, as you said, by your employees. They're being driven by, uh, uh, in the case of some of the, the, uh, the northern European pensions, they're being driven by the pensioners that are saying this is our money that you're managing to our benefit and we desire these uh, values to be included in the way by the way you're not off the hook you still have to manage fiduciarily we still want our pension checks but we want these to reflect our values if you look at what's happening and one of the most important things that's happening uh, in the u.s markets and it's prompting people like uh, uh, or companies like uh, blackrock and goldman is in the private banks we're now seeing clients, uh, especially uh, gender, as well as the millennials, beginning to institute uh, a change in the client objectives. Values are now being put back in place. Duration is being put in, in, into, into the core strategies. And so it's the, it's the client demand that's driving this. So, so in a lot of ways, um, this is about being responsive to either your beneficiaries or to your to your clients and we see momentum across across almost every market almost every segment of the investment world from high net worth all the way through to institutional they are different market segments they have very different vocabulary very different needs but consistent across that we're seeing uh, changes, catalysts taking place. So we're relatively uh, optimistic about, about the importance of this. You know, I said it before, in the 1980s, uh, in the mid-80s, you actually had company CEOs of Global 500s talking about how impossible it was to implement quality. 10, 15 years later, you would sound absolutely ridiculous if you got out in front of, of your consumers or your, 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 your employees and said, quality is just not possible. I mean, you just weren't in business. And, and I think that, that over the next few years, if you're not implementing much as Larry Fink or, 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 or even the Department of Labor in, in the United States, you know, if you're not thinking about the downside risks as well as the opportunity set of both responsibility, climate change, the environment, social, you're probably not investing uh, uh, for the long term and you're probably not investing with all the data that you need to make a fiduciary decision. Yeah. Good last words. Thank yeah. you, uh, David, very much for joining us. It's been uh, Great to have you here to start this discussion, Thank hopefully. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Helga, Birna and Gunnar, uh, those of you here in Harpa and watching us uh, live or in the recording online. Uh, thank you very much and welcome to us again at Wafibia. Thank you.